All right, good day to everybody. It is April 7th, and we continue in 2 Samuel chapters 8 through 12. We've got five chapters to do today. Uh, a lot of material, so we're going to hit uh, the high points uh, just to put this in a larger context. So we start out with chapter 8, and uh, basically chapter 8 uh, is sort of a summary of, of David conquering enemies and expanding the kingdom of Israel. In fact, he begins to expand it uh, beyond the borders that it has previously held. So he's very successful in his campaign. Um, and uh, we're told in verse 13 that David won a name for himself. So, <clears throat> so um, David is enlarging in the kingdom. And the other thing that's important to note is that he really establishes a functional working kingdom. This is not any longer a bunch of uh, tribes and a conf loose confederacy uh, in which they're going back and forth. This is, this is, uh, this is a, a kingdom that now appears to be united. And we can uh, glean this from the end of chapter eight, starting with verse 15 to the end, verse 18 where David reigns over all of Israel and he administers justice and equity to all his people. And then we get um, a brief list of a, in a sense of David's cabinet, uh, the leaders who have uh, charge of various uh, areas. So what we have here, uh, it seems perhaps for the first time is a really a real functioning government uh, that David is able to uh, uh, consolidate. So, so this means that Israel is in pretty good shape uh, for the time being as a kingdom of people. We get to chapter nine, which is a short chapter, and it just tells us about David's kindness to Jonathan's grandson, Mephibosheth. Uh, and he is the grandson of Jonathan, who, remember, was crippled uh, when he was dropped at the age of five, when his nurse was fleeing violence. Uh, and David wants to, again, remember that the practice is that you want to get rid of any previous uh, uh, family's uh, relatives that were reigning, that if you are, if you rise to the throne and your predecessor is not part of your house, you want to get rid of his house because you don't want any contenders to the throne. Well, that's not David's approach. Uh, because of his relationship to Jonathan, Saul's son, David shows kindness to Mephibosheth and restores property to him and also has him eat at the king's table, which is quite the honor to be able to eat with the king at the king's table. So this is David. This is a, an example, again, of David's uh, fierce loyalty to his friends and to those who mean so much to him. Um, so we get to chapter 10, and you've got more of, uh, of, of the exploits of David in the, in the army. And then we get to chapter 11, which is the Bathsheba story. So it's the springtime of the year, and it's the time that the writer wants to tell us this is when the kings go out to battle. It's spring. The weather is becoming good. The ground is good. And so if you're going to make war, this is the time to do it. So usually uh, the kings go out with their armies because it's considered to be, first of all, if you're a king, uh, you increase your status if you're a warrior. So the kings normally go out. But this spring, David decides to stay home for reasons we're not told. Nothing uh, uh, necessarily uh, bad about this decision. He just decides he's going to stay home. And so David uh, one day is out looking around over his kingdom. The city of David, remember, is on a, uh, a hill, a sloping hill. And so David with his palace, which would have been in the north of the city. Uh, at some point, I'm going to I'm going to show you map of, a map of Jerusalem from the time of David through Jesus, and so to see how the city expands. Jerusalem is quite a small town, if you will, in, in uh, uh, David's day. It's not, it's not the larger city that uh, Jesus would have known. But David is looking down, and no doubt he can see on the tops of roofs. Remember, a roof, a roof of a house is where 
you might sit in the cool of the evening. And uh, if you're in this part of the world, you might take some meals there, uh, but also there's courtyards and courtyards tend to not have roofs, but uh, surrounded by walls. And so David spies Bathsheba, who is bathing. And uh, so David uh, summons her and um, they end up sleeping together. Now, this is one thing that needs to be said and, and uh, need to be careful. That, and we need to be careful how we, how, we, how we think about this. We often call it David's adultery with Bathsheba. And it is, it's adultery by, uh, by the law of Moses. But to be honest, we, we should and we could and should call this the rape of Bathsheba. Um, it's not that uh, ba David forces himself on Bathsheba, but that Bathsheba has no choice. This is the king. And uh, if you spurn the king, not only could uh, the consequences be severe for you, but how about your husband? And so Bathsheba really has no options here. This, this is, uh, this, so this amounts to sexual assault. This amounts to David having the power to get what he wants and Bathsheba having no recourse. So Bathsheba does what she has no choice in that context to do. She becomes pregnant and sends David a message. And so David makes it worse. He compounds the problem. And so he sends for Uriah the Hittite. This is, this is Bathsheba's husband and summons him under the pretense of counseling with him about the war. How's it going? Now, this is strange because Uriah is a valiant warrior. He's an officer. He's important. But he doesn't have the position that you would want to consult with him on battles that are being waged, right? That You want to talk to Joab. So he summons Uriah. No doubt Uriah is probably a little surprised by this. But in addition to that, uh, David really doesn't talk much about specifics. You know, if you were going to if you were going to talk to somebody like Uriah, the very least you wanted to inquire specifically in what he was encountering and get his advice. But no, it's very general conversation. And so uh, David says, OK, go home, take a couple of days, uh, relax and and, uh, you know, spend time with your wife. Um, and we find that Uriah doesn't do that. In fact, Uriah sleeps on the king's palace doorstep. Now, it could be possibly, we, we can't rule out, the text doesn't tell us, but we cannot rule out that perhaps Uriah is somewhat suspicious here. Not suspicious about Bathsheba, but suspicious that maybe David uh, suspects him of treason, of disloyalty. Uh, and that's why he's called him back to the palace. He must have been confused as to why he got some of all people. And so maybe what he's doing by sleeping on the doorstep of the king is he is saying, he's trying to say to the king, I'm loyal. I'm loyal to you. I'm loyal to my men. How can I go uh, and spend time with my wife and, and be comfortable the next couple of days uh, while my men are out there uh, lying on the battlefield, sleeping uh, in the open and uh, uh, doing, doing all the, the sacrificing that you do when you go to battle, go to war. And so David tries to entice him to go uh, to spend the night with his wife so he can cover this up, but he refuses to do it. He's just not going to do it. So finally, David relents and sends him back and sends a message to Joab about making sure that Uriah is put into the heat of the battle and that the troops withdraw uh, and leave him vulnerable to being killed. Now, you would wonder that Joab would have some questions about this, but also remember that David's the king and kings give orders and you follow those orders. There's no questioning. Well, you could question at times if you have a good relationship with the king, but you know, there's no questioning of it. So, so Joab does what David asks and Uriah is killed. So now David has not only um, committed adultery, sexual assault, but he has conspired uh, for murder. And you could, you, I mean, I don't know what the courts would, it wouldn't, 
would uh, charge him with because David didn't do the deed himself, but he conspires in order that Joab will be killed. So this clearly is a crime. So <clears throat> um, Bathsheba hears the word, David hears the word, Bathsheba goes into mourning. Um, usually it's seven days of mourning to a month. And when that time is over, we're told David sends for her, brings her into his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. So uh, the reality is, and, and by the way, no one would really thought anything different of it. Uriah's dead. Uh, no one would have known the plot at this point. And uh, uh, so David uh, is certainly within his rights as king to bring Bathsheba into, into his house. And Bathsheba, again, would have really had no choice. She's pregnant, uh, and now she's a widow. She's between a, a rock and a hard place. So, so uh, again, she whether, whether this is something she wants or not, we're not told, but she really has no options here. So let's, let's uh, understand that. Okay, so we get to chapter 12, and it is uh, sometime later, uh, but we don't know how long. And we're, to we're told right in verse 12 that what David has done is displeased the Lord. So the prophet Nathan comes to David. And again, this is one of the important things we need to say about the way the, the kingship of Israel is structured, that even the kings are subject to the words of the prophets. Uh, the kings do not have authority over the prophets. They must listen to the word of the Lord. That's what makes uh, uh, Saul's behavior so egregious, because he acts uh, even against the words of the prophets to the point where prophets are scared of him. So David comes and he gives them this little story. Now remember too, David's a shepherd. So he would have related to this story about a guy who has all kinds of lambs and he's wealthy and, but he has a guest come and he's too cheap, uh, to kill one of his own lambs to provide for his friend. So he goes to, and gets the lamb of this poor guy, this, this poor guy who had a lamb who was actually part of the family. The lamb actually eats at the table um, uh, of the man. And uh, so he takes the lamb and he has it slaughtered for his friend. And when David hears this, of course, he is incensed. He, 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 the injustice of this it is just angering to him and he wants to know who he's going to make sure that this guy pays uh, for his crime and not only pays for his crime does restitution and more so to this man whose lamb he took and then in the classic uh, response that echoes down through history Nathan says to David you are the man you are the man in verse seven thus says the Lord the God of Israel I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom and, you, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. Notice that you have struck him down, right? He didn't do the deed, but you have struck him down. Remember Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount will say, you don't actually have to commit murder to be guilty of it. You struck down Uriah the Hittite and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. What's the curse? The sword now will never depart from your house. You and your family and your descendants will fight and war with each other. There will be intrigue. There will be no peace because of what you have done. And in the other judgment is that David and Bathsheba's son will die. This is disturbing that the son should die because of the sin of the father. But we all do remember and do know that so often our children do pay for our sins, don't they? We are still in our country dealing with the great sin of 400 years of slavery or 200, 300 years of slavery. So if there's one thing we get out of this, I suppose that's it, that, that, the, that our sins, uh, that there will be sins we're committing that our children and grandchildren will have to clean up and deal with. So maybe that's the thought we get out of this. But anyway, 
so this is the curse. And so uh, the child dies and David, uh, of course, David is interceding that the child won't die and he's fasting and he won't eat. And when he announces that the child is dead, he uh, cleans himself up and gets ready and gets the life back to normal. And this is surprising to the people because the time of mourning is after the child's death. I said a week to a month and they want to know why. And David says, I, there's nothing that I can do now. And um, he is dead and uh, I can't bring him back again. So he continues on with his life. What we find out then is that uh, David and Bathsheba have another son whose name is Solomon. And um, he also, he is named, we're told in verse 25, Jedidiah, which means beloved of the Lord. So what we could have here, although we're not told, it could possibly, I mean, because Jedidiah is a really Hebrew name. It could be that Jedidiah is Solomon's given name. And Solomon might be his his royal name, his, his kingly name. We don't know. That's just a guess. But it could also be that he, he uh, goes around with both names from early on. But he's known to us certainly as Solomon. So we end the chapter with uh, David crushing the Ammonites, more of David's conquests of uh, surrounding people and, and consolidating and expanding his kingdom. And then we start in chapter 13 tomorrow. And the rest of the book will actually deal less with Israel's problems from outsiders that we're going to see exactly Nathan's words are coming true, that David's house is a house divided and will be. And we'll see this go into even first Kings and second Kings. So the sin of David will have far reaching repercussions, something for all of us to remember. All right, let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of this day and this time again and for the beauty of this day. May we glorify you. May our words and deeds be pleasing and acceptable in your sight in this day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, friends. Later on. <laughs>